in the days of my training in the fossil fuel ravaged hills of the Rhondda Valley, there was still talk of a legendary preacher called Empty Chair Evans. And whenever he spoke at a funeral, having opened the big Bible Black Bible, folk would listen out with delight for the inevitable phrase, Ah, the empty chair! The name of the deceased would change with each funeral if they were lucky, though in that part of Wales it might well be a Jones, a Davis or another Evans anyway. Empty chair Evans mourned and the people had the chance to weep. Mrs Jones played the pipes and if they didn't actually dance, then at least they sang and sang as well as Welsh congregations might well do to this day. And for all its limitations, the game they played together for that moment was real and sustaining and healing. Like you today in online gathering, there is call and there is response. Today we are playing without embarrassment games that help us feel at home in, but do not fix the bewildering environment of loss, bereavement, indeed of lockdown. Games which strengthen us and prepare us to see it through and perhaps even transform what children like us cannot fix or defeat. Weeping and dancing, life in its fullness. Do not worry about tomorrow, says Jesus, because you're up to your eyes in the kakia today. Not that tomorrow isn't worth worrying about. This last week, the UK Government Committee on Climate Change brought out a report it runs to about 80,000 words, and the tone is mixed. On the one hand, it is as loyal and patriotic as Zechariah, exulting in the leadership of the UK as we approach the United Nations Environment Conference, the COP, next year. Yet if this were a school report on those children in the marketplace, its summary would be, could do better and there's little expectation at present that better will be better enough. Because there's talk of resilience for a totally intolerable four degrees of warming in the lifetime of little children today. Which is why, as of this time, I believe the best contribution a local church can make for ourselves and for others is the direction of spiritual resilience. What do I mean by that? Because I can still thank God for each day, I've managed to annoy people who think that's inconsistent with an awareness that makes me tremble for the fate of my children. And part of that sustaining gratitude is thanks to large parts of tradition and scripture whose mourning and dancing we have disregarded, like the, the scary verses in Matthew's Gospel about consequences of ignoring warnings. These are verses which were excluded from our lectionary this week. In a time of environmental crisis, environmental Christianity is Christianity. The call to repent is the call to adapt. It's not just about genesis and, and tilling and keeping, uh, not as if human beings were the dominant culmination of that story. Actually, it's the Sabbath, the blessed time of stopping and letting go, finding rest for your souls. Then there's the other thousand pages of struggles for justice on earth, the partnership of God with creation, including us. And we discover that to be human is to be ingenious and to be versatile. So strangely, to their surprise, if people ask me what books to study in the face of the climate emergency, and even right now, my first answer, joking and yet not joking, is the Bible, all of it. But with eyes wide open for the radical spiritual resources that we need in this time. So don't be too sensible, too grown up or too precious. That's not the Christian way. It wasn't Jesus' way. The prophet who in chapter 9 of Zechariah took on the mantle of Zechariah, hijacking the old traditions of supremacy over nasty foreigners, 
Zechariah was himself then subversively hijacked by Jesus as he entered Jerusalem on the donkey. And the Gospel writers in the accounts of Palm Sunday make a nonsense of the mature wisdom of war and domination. If congregations are looking for resources, and for goodness sake we spend a lot of time putting resources together, my first answer, playing and not playing, is that you are the resource. If people ask, what shall we do? My first answer, joking and maybe not joking, is be the church. Be a people choosing and acting on hope without waiting for permission. Be a people who are conspicuously seen to care for creation without pretending either that we're in charge or that we have all the answers. Though equally not capitulating to the satanic lie that we are just an ornamental irrelevance. Let the bells of creation ring in our liturgy and our prayer, which is our immersion in the earth in which Christ himself is incarnate. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Doing more to save your souls is the creed that's killing the planet. It seems a lot more difficult than that because it's a lot easier than that. Active, committed congregations in our movement are wont to discover that simply doing more is a strategy both for burnout and for evading more fundamental change, of course. Haven't we learned in this interlude of clean air, clear seawater and loud bird song that letting go can make a difference? Walk, cycle, don't drive or fly, do your best. Far more than facts and figures, spirituality is a vehicle for change. And organised religion makes spirituality available to people who don't have to be part of an elite. Jesus too is grateful for people who are foolish enough, childlike enough, even childish enough to find joy in this all. That's been the big difference about Church Online in these months. What was previously looked on as a fiddly game for teenage nerds has become real. One of the great values of faith communities and churches in particular, alongside playing the pipes, or the Kayleys if you like, is their custodianship of mourning and bereavement. God's hand to hold as we encounter the worst things in the world. I have also experienced as a carer to a terminally ill partner the resilient wisdom of a palliative approach, that is giving thanks beyond common sense for good things about each day we're given. To let the path of life be journey or even pilgrimage rather than a commute to be endured or got over with. Less, it's less about achievement. Hope without denial is possible, though never inevitable. Small things that may not of themselves save the world make life much more worth living for ourselves and for others. Prayer, action, what your church does with those scraps of space through which you express to passers-by what you are about. The idea of our Gold Award is that no passerby should be in any doubt that Christian faith in our day occupies the same ground as deep commitment to climate justice for the earth, for those worst and first affected. Though I must make a very clear distinction between delightfully encouraging steps which dance us forward on a difficult road and the sometimes bigger and superficially positive steps which by contrast lock us in, exhaust our capacity for change, making us wallflowers instead. Those things are usually sold to us as solutions, which means an excuse to think no further about an ongoing crisis, like building houses now which take no account of changing climate or fuel options. The dominant wisdom of our culture even when climate emergency is acknowledged, still looks for salvation towards unlimited single-use growth, albeit green growth, which sounds as if someone's doing something. Do we, as people of faith, 
dare to be skeptical. Creation is full of cycles of water, carbon, of the elements of life itself, weeping and dancing and more, that like the word of God have a job to do between heaven and earth, between sky and soil. The same heaven and earth and sky and soil that in the Eucharistic prayer are. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. No well, green tweaking needed. Nice. Though every generation tweaks according to their perceived agenda. Have the confidence still to do so. The diverse writers of the Bible take comfort in the superficial eternity and resilience of creation cycles and yet also they acknowledge their finitude. So alongside our prohibition of human limits we've also sneaked everlasting and forever into the place of to the end of the age. We've made limitlessness into a God though God sets limits. The games we play risk losing their God-given rooting in the tragedy, comedy and wonder and fragility of real life. Real church is always provisional, not permanent. Always previously when I've read these words of Jesus about this generation being like little children playing in the marketplace surrounded by the hustle and bustle that takes no notice of them, I've tended perhaps as a hard-pressed parent to conclude that, that we're talking about is the sort of peevish childish nonsense that Paul claimed to have left behind him when he became a man. And I've set this against the childlikeness that Jesus commends if we are to grasp the kingdom of heaven. Today I see more sympathy, more love in Jesus' comparison, looking to the difficult phases of life when the preparatory games of tears and joy take on an earnest. Have we been playing at being church until this point.